Hi guys, it's Emily Craven here from the Original Fantasy uh, blog and thank you very much for uh, listening to this recording of the Meet the Author webinar with the fantastic New York Times bestseller Sean Williams. It was a wonderful webinar. We had people from all over the world, from the US and from the UK. But uh, the reason I'm recording this introduction is because I wanted to say a big sorry, I forgot to press the record button at the start of the webinar. So we've lost the first 10 to 15 minutes of the uh, webinar interview where Sean explains a little bit about where he wa writes and also he started to explain a little bit about what his top manuscript editing tips were. As part of that, Sean showed everybody a video of uh, one of the ruthless edits that he has done. Now, uh, if you have a look here, the uh, blue is the areas that he's deleted, red is the extra things he's added in, green is where he swapped stuff, grey is where he's completely cut it out, and the tiny bit of black you see is what was originally there at the start of the uh, ruthless edit. So, uh, I know a lot of people were horrified in the <laughs> webinar when they saw how much had been added and, and taken away, uh, and Sean gives uh, still gives some fantastic fantastic tips in, in the part of the recording that I caught. If you uh, were interested in uh in attending uh, some of the other Meet the Author webinars, we plan to do some more in the start of the year with some uh, fantastic speculative fiction authors. So if you'd like to get the updates on when those are going to be happening, please feel free to sign up uh, for the updates at tiny.cc slash meet the author. Uh, we only have limited numbers for each webinar, so if you want to make sure that you get in with your favourite author and be able to ask them all of your questions and uh, be able to, to basically talk to uh, them directly and then hear them speak to you live from wherever you are in the world, please uh, sign up at tiny.cc slash meet the author and we'll have some great webinars for you at the start of next year. Uh, until then, please uh, enjoy uh, the webinar with Sean Williams. Thanks very much, guys. He's dying on the page. Uh, so I was trying to find... Uh new ways to lift every single sentence up. Another time I was trying to condense all the dialogue down. I was a big fan of, of Lost, the TV show, and one of the things I loved about Lost was the way they would capture enormously complicated things in just a few lines of dialogue. And I thought, well, that was very powerful the way they did it. It often left things unexplained, but sometimes it didn't matter because the explanation came later in a, in a different scene. And uh, so I tried to do that. And so with each draft, I was trying to do different things. Some drafts I was trying to expand on the emotional content. Sometimes I was trying to shrink the whole manuscript, looking at every single sentence, to, if it was necessary or not. And if it wasn't, I had to kind of cut it. So um, yeah, every draft, something different. Yes. <laughs> I, um, whenever I do uh, try to do rewrites, I do, do sometimes I put it into Kindle and stick it on my, on my tablet. And that's a completely mm. different, though it's still a screen, <clears throat> it's a different size and, and the, mm. the, the, as you said, the font is different and so all of a sudden all these things start jumping out of the woodwork. Ah, yeah, that's right. Just changing the font size means that you, you know, you see all those typos where you've, you've gone from one line and then it's wrapped around to the beginning of the next line and there's often a word missing in that little gap and until you change the font size or the font, you, you, your mind just reads that missing word like it's a, you know, a, a ghost that's you know, inexpungible. But, uh, so that for that reason alone, it's very important to change fonts and font sizes and, and colours too and read aloud and read on tablets and read every way you can. Um, and in fact, the best way to notice stuff, uh, although you should never do this, is to read over somebody's shoulder while they're reading your manuscript. There is nothing that makes you more self-aware about what's on the page than watching somebody read your own work. It's terrifying. And it's also awful for the person who's reading because uh, you're always saying, oh, did you like that bit? Or, or why did you frown when you read that bit? You know, it's just unbearable. You should never do that to your readers. <laughs> I can see you doing that, actually. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Freaking lurking over the shop. I know. I have done it in the past, and I will never do it again. It's too horrible. <laughs> I, um, I actually have a Sheila here. With, uh, she's talking about the video we just showed, and she said on your editing page, there's a whole different clue there. She, she says there's so much there. She's a little bit horrified about the amount of stuff you deleted. And you're, very, you're very ruthless in your editing. Well, one, um, one thing I've learned from writing 40 books or whatever I've written is that uh, it's amazing the violence you can inflict on a book and and it survives, you know, it's incredible. I used to be so afraid when I was editing my early books that I would break something really critical and then the story would just fold up like a house of cards. And I realise now that you can, 
you hear, and, and you'd hear these stories about pulp writers in the, in the 40s and 50s. They'd deliver a book that was 80,000 words long, and the editor would say, it has to be half that long. And the writer would go, I don't know how to do it. And the editor would go, I know how we'll do it. We'll just take out every other page and stitch it back together and we'll call that the manuscript. And, and I was always thinking, how's that possible? How's that possible? You just, you just destroy the book. And then you, you get into uh, you know, uh, editing mode yourself and you get used to it and you can see how a book might actually survive that kind of damage. The, the, a book that has a solid story to it, that has good characters in it, uh, is almost indestructible. Uh, and and, and uh, the idea is, of course, to make it better, not just to not destroy it. So hopefully all those deletions uh, were replaced with stuff that was, was better. Um, so do you feel that it's yours? In Sheila wants to know if you feel that it's yours in the end, after mm. all that editing input from your editor. Uh, yeah, it's still mine. I mean, she, this, this was a book that they had contracted and paid for, don't forget. Uh, she would never have done this, invested this kind of work in a book that she didn't really believe in and couldn't really see what the book... Uh, was about. She she had a, a, a very clear idea of what my clear idea of what the book should be and everything she, she did was geared towards bringing my book out better. Um, so there was never any point where, uh, I mean she, she's an amazing editor and we got on really well so, so I think we were very, very simpatico um, in the way we worked together and that there was never anything that she said where I felt that she had misunderstood what I was trying to do. Because I'm, I'm not one to believe that a book is ever perfect or, or completely finished. There's always room to improve and I've been, I've been really wanting to work with an editor like this for a long time because I've always felt that my books could be better, that there could be, there could be more in them that I wasn't able to bring out. And I've become a better writer down the years, um, you know, I hope, having written 39 books without, without an editor like Anne. Um, or with editors that uh, you know work very differently, um, but I felt that I'd kind of hit the point where I'd self-taught myself as much as I possibly could, and I, and I feel like working with Anne has enabled me to, for the first time, bring out a book in the way that's very very close. Because when you when you imagine a book, when it's in your head, it's absolutely perfect. You know, that's that's it, 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 a book will never be as good as it was before you started writing it. Once you start writing it, there's like a translation error. It never comes out as well as you imagine it. It's like a, trying to describe a dream. You have this, this beautiful image of this fantastic dream in your head and as soon as you try to describe it to somebody, you start stumbling and tripping over and realising you actually don't know what's going on. And it's a bit like that with, uh, with books and I really feel like that now it really is my book but Anne has facilitated making it the best book I could ever write. We've got some comments here actually about the the, um, the covers, the book covers that we have here on the screen. Um, ah, there's some like beautiful they covers. Said that they're, they're absolutely fabulous. And they ask, you know, are you involved? One of the ladies, Sheila, she has a flying ship in her. Ah, She's cool. wondering, do they, you know, take your considerations into the well, I'm glad we've got the stone mage and the sea up here. Uh, the, the picture on the bottom right is uh, an illustration by the the multiple award-winning genius Sean Tan and uh, uh, this was my first fantasy novel, I think it was the fifth novel I wrote, fifth or sixth and I actually, before we got into discussions about the cover, I actually had a dream where I walked into a bookstore and saw the book on the shelf and it was this, the cover of the book was this old guy with tattoos staring out of the cover. And I emailed my editor and said, "Look, you know, feel free to ignore this, but uh, I had this dream whether this was the cover." And she said, "I like that. Um, let's 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 show it to Sean and see what he thinks, and we'll see what marketing thinks." And Sean did this amazing cover of the face that you can see there, except it, the face filled the cover, and it was exactly as I dreamed it. It was except a little bit better because Sean Tan is a genius, and. Uh, um, and as far as I was concerned, that could have been the cover. It was absolutely brilliant. But then marketing came along and said, he looks a bit scary. And it doesn't look like a kid's book. It was a, a, a book that was aimed for sort of 13-year-olds and up. So they made the decision to shift the face slightly off centre, add some, some beach and add the, the protagonist, the boy on the cover. And so I had quite a lot of input on, on that cover. And, uh, and it was so close to what I dreamed that it was <coughs> you know, unbelievable. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I was very, very fortunate. With the other covers that are up there, um, Oh, I'm terribly embarrassed that I can't remember the artist's name. Uh, he's a, an amazing Australian artist and uh, I let him have complete free reign. I, I sort of described um, what particular scenes or features from the books might be appropriate for the covers and then he just went off and did these incredible covers that, that 
capture perfectly the mood and the descriptions. Um, my favourite of those four covers. Oh, you know, I've, I love the Hanging Mountains. I think the Hanging Mountains is such a magical cover. But I also think the Blood Debt is a, is, is a beautiful cover as well, and the Devoured Earth. Yeah, I think I've been so lucky with my fantasy novels. The covers have been so beautiful and so perfectly captured. Behind the Devoured Earth, one of my favourite things about these covers is behind the titles of Devo the Devoured Earth is hidden the the big bad of the series, this giant monster that's kind of part crab, part giant cockroach, part Godzilla, and you can hardly see it. And I, one of the things I love about some covers that, of my favourite books that I've, that I've read is that you might have read the book a thousand times, but one day you'll pick up the book and you'll see it in a different way and you'll go, wow, there's something in that cover that I've never seen before. And I love that that, that feature of the cover is something that somebody might not see until the tenth time they pick it up. And it's, uh, it's exactly as I imagined the critter too. It's uh, terrifying. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I actually, rather embarrassingly, went back and read these these books. Uh, I don't normally read my own books because um, I'm a little bit too close to them and I'm always a bit embarrassed. But uh, I was giving my editor in England a set of the, the Stone Mage and the Sea trilogy. And I, as I um, was looking at the books in England, I realised that I'd forgotten the opening lines. and I, So I went back and read the opening lines of each book and I thought, oh, yeah, that's right. And that got me kind of interested in the books again and I realised that I'd forgotten most of what happened in them. I'd forgot, I remembered key points and I knew who the characters were but I'd forgotten what the stories were so I bought them bought as e-books and uh, started reading them and uh, I saw lots of faults and things that I would do different now because I wrote those books 30 books ago. Um, but I enjoyed them enough to then go and read the other books which are the kind of the prequels and, and sequels and uh, uh, so I, I feel a little bit embarrassed confessing it, but I actually quite enjoyed them. <laughs> I could see I could see why I'd enjoyed writing them, and I think that it was nice to be that distant enough that I could go, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten. This bit's coming up. That's right. I remember thinking that was really cool. And occasionally it worked, and uh, I got to just feel quite smug and happy about it. <laughs> That's great. It's good to hear somebody else can send me back, because I've had instances where I've done that, and I've accidentally read really late into the night and gone, Oh no, you should. Yeah, you should always love your own work. I think if you don't, uh, then maybe you've worked on it too much. But you should always be able to come back to it and go, "Yeah, that's right. That was cool. I remember why I wanted to write this because it was cool." Um, we have a question here from Sophie. Sophie wanted to know um, how difficult do you find it to decide? where a novel's going to begin, so whether oh, that be the yeah. chapter or whether that be the first sentence. Yeah, well, uh, I find that a hard question to answer. <laughs> I usually don't start a book until I know what the ending of book will be, the book will be, and uh, if possible, the closing line. Um, and I find that once I know that, because the end of a story should be what the beginning's about. So if you know what the ending's going to be, that kind of tells you what the beginning will be in a way. But sometimes I don't get it right. Twin Maker is a case in point where um, for the first 12 drafts, um, I had the opening scene. I didn't change the opening scene at all. And it was only in the latest rewrites that I did actually end up writing a completely new beginning uh, that never existed until draft 13. So um, I got it wrong in that point. Um, but I feel that I've got it right now. So I don't always get it right, but usually... Usually I'm looking for, uh, I don't want an opening line that's too exciting because if an opening line is, is so exciting, then the second, the second line won't be as good as the opening line and you're starting off on a downward trend straight away. So I want a, an opening line that will be evocative and reasonably simple um, but will promise um, greater complexity and uh, uh, um, interesting things to come. And the opening scene, gee, I don't know. I think. It, do you chop and change it a lot? I, to where you start? Yeah, I do. I mean, I chop and change everything as I rewrite. But to the beginning, I find it hard to start until I've got a, a good opening sentence. So that tends not to change. Um, but the opening scene can change. Uh, and I'm resistant to changing my opening scenes once I've got them because I do feel like they're so fundamental to the book. I feel quite suspiciously and superstitiously, uh, that uh, if I change the opening scene, then that will change the rest of the novel in a way that I may not be prepared for or may not fully comprehend. 
Um, but I am open to the idea. I haven't had any editors until until Anne came along and said, "We well, need a new something different at the beginning." I don't think this is quite working, and that's that's when I went back voluntarily and said, "Okay, well, let's try a whole new beginning." In fact, let's try three or four different ones until we've got the right one. So um, it's tricky. Um, hmm. I'm not sure if that's answered your question, Sophie. I'm sorry. I feel like I've, I'm sort of bumbling my way through not answering it. But <laughs> you can let us know, Sophie, if you want a bit of elaboration. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I was surprised when I was looking at the, those opening, when I was looking at those fantasy novels and realised that I'd forgotten the opening lines, I'd forgotten the opening scenes, that, that it is something that I do invest a lot in, and to realise that I'd kind of forgotten them. For books, it's like forgetting the names of your child, you know. It's uh, It felt like a terrible betrayal, but, uh, you know. There's only so much I, I can keep in my head. I'm getting old. So. Oh, you're not. Uh, <laughs> just because you have a vortex doesn't make you That's right. <laughs> Thank um, you. I have um, a question here from um, Norda, who is actually, I think, probably the most dedicated of our listeners here. Because she's up at 5 a.m. in the morning in the U.S. Wow, fantastic. Um, Kudos to you. Thank you so much, uh, Norda. Uh, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Yeah, apologies if I'm not. Uh, and thank you very much for saying that you're you're enjoying this. Um, <laughs> thank you for me too. <laughs> yeah, so we're doing well, Sean. We're doing oh, well. Um, so Norita wanted to know um, if you can talk a little bit about the difference between writing in a universe you've created and then writing in somebody else's universe. Mm, like and, Star Wars. Yeah, mm. exactly. And for new writers, which would you recommend that they try? Uh, well, I think. Um, New writers should try lots and lots of different things, and uh, one of those things they can try is to create their own universe, and one of the things they can try is to work in somebody else's universe, and another thing they can try to do is uh, work with somebody else in collaboration. And uh, when I was starting out uh, writing novels, I did all three. And so, in fact, my first novel was a collaboration set in somebody else's universe. Um, I started off writing with a fellow called Shane Dix, and he and I wrote a novel set in a, a shared world um, that we later then turned into a, a novel set in our own world. Um, and at the same time, I was also writing a novel set in my own world. So my first solo novel was Metal Fatigue. My first collaborative novel was um, The Unknown Soldier, which later became Prodigal Son. And I learned a lot from, from both. Uh, writing with a collaborator, oh, maybe we'll talk about that later, but writing in somebody else's world uh, when it's a really rich world like, say, Doctor Who or Star Wars, um, the constraint doesn't really come from the world itself. Um, if, I don't know whether any of you have been to Wikipedia, um, the sort of Wikipedia of Star Wars, uh, but once you start dipping into that, you realise just how immense and complicated and rich the fictional world has become. So um, there's no shortage of, of people and races and places to muck around with. It, it's you hardly need to make anything up at all. And same with Doctor Who, you know, almost 50 years of, of stuff in Doctor Who, you, you don't, you're never short of something to, to play with. What is, what can be harder, uh, where the constraints do come in, is in the kinds of stories you're allowed to tell. So if you were writing a Star Wars novel, you couldn't make it a, a horror movie style, a horror story in which, say, Luke turned crazy and started killing all the Solo clan or, um, Darth Vader came back from the dead as a zombie. They have actually had zombie Star Wars novels, but uh, but on the whole, you're generally trying to replicate the the experience of seeing Episode Four, Five, and Six, you know, for the first time. That's what you're really aiming for. Uh, and same with Doctor Who. You, you the Doctor the Doctor would never be a baddie, an overt kind of baddie. He he has a particular even in his various incarnations, he he has a particular way of going through things and a particular kind of story you tell by Doctor Who. So you, you're constrained in that regard. Uh, but creative constraints, I think, can be good. Um, when somebody get, sits you in front of a computer and says, you can write anything you want, sometimes it's very hard to know what you want to write. Whereas if somebody sits you, on a, sits you in front of a computer and says, I want you to write something that's like Star Wars, but your own thing, uh, then that can be easier. And I certainly found that with my first novel, in a way. I found I loved the freedom of doing everything the way I wanted to go, but there were choices at every step, you know. Um, there, were, there was nothing I could fall back on, really. Um, everything I had to invent. And that can get a little bit tiresome <laughs> after a while when you're writing science fiction or fantasy and, and uh, everything has to be made up. Um, it just it's, it creates a bit of a brain drain. It gives you wonderful freedom, opportunities to be creative. But um, I've written a bit of stuff said in the real world and that's in the contemporary real world, world is just fantastic. You know, if you want to know how someone would get from A to B, you could look up a particular model of a helicopter and, and get all the, the, the specs and uh, have 
the names are there. You don't need to make anything up. It's uh, that can be very freeing as well. But of course, that comes with its own constraints. So, mm. um, and, and I mean, like Narada um, had the question. You know, does writing fanfic help new writer or hinder? And I had a conversation mm. about this with another uh, author, and they were talking about the fact that, that you know they started off in fanfic, and the the reason why they found it so good was that because you know they could go with a character that was already. There, mm. and then change things about the world so they didn't have to think up both character and yeah, the world that's right. and situation. They could mm. fall back on the character, create and you know, have a, a semi uh, solid world that they could add, still add things to mm. they didn't have to think up everything and then they could yeah. create the situation. So she yeah. found it as a good way to ease herself into then writing her own stuff. Yeah, that's right. So it is very hard to sort of leap in uh, uh, and try to learn everything all at once. Um, I certainly struggled with that, and in some ways it was easier um, to, as you say, to, to have things you can fall back on and, and not take for granted, but um, understand how they work without having to think too hard about it. I, but, but when I first started writing, when I was very, very young, um, one of the first things I wrote was a t Doctor Who script. I don't know, I seriously thought that my Doctor Who versus the Master script might actually uh, be published, but it never was. And, and my, the first novel I finished was a sort of a Douglas Adams pastiche, and, and my second novel was, uh, you know, a H.G. Wells parody. So, uh, and so on. All, all my early works, and even when I started writing my short stories, were almost self-consciously um, drawing on the works of others. And uh, only as I got more experienced and uh, a, a bit more practiced at some of the nuts and boltsy kind of things, could I then start applying my own sort of creativity to what I was writing. So I think I think it's actually a good thing to do and I think it's certainly nothing to be ashamed of. I know a lot of people look down on fanfic and stuff, but I think there's nothing wrong with it. God, if, if the internet existed when I was 12, my fan would, would, fanfic would still be out there now. <laughs> and, um, and that's a very important point, I think, as well, is that um, you wrote a lot of different stories that never got published. Mm. And then a whole heap that did. And um, mm. the, the key to that was the yeah, my 80th short story is coming out in December, uh, but there are 46 that will never be published. So I've got a hit rate of a little less than two in three, uh, and most of those ones that never got published were early ones too. But still, you know, still I, I'm capable of writing badly <laughs> sometimes. Uh, you know, I'm sure I'll get my grammar all right, but every now and again I'll just pick the wrong story and uh, it just won't work as well as the next one I write. And that's okay. You know, you move on. <laughs> Out of all the characters you've created, Narada wants to know. Well, I uh, have a soft spot. What my, they, they kind of come from my fantasy novels, I think partly because uh, all my fantasy novels, uh, apart from the ones that I write with Garth, are all set in one particular world. Um, and some of the characters have appeared in as many as six books. Um, so I've really drilled down quite deeply into their characters and spent a lot of time with them. So um, there's a, a young fellow called Roslyn of Geheb who I really like, um, who I, whose story I'm still exploring. He, he featured in three books and was mentioned briefly in another, but I'm still telling his story via, via short stories and novellas. And in fact, if I do a reading, I'll read you one of his stories. Then, um, and there's another character in those series called Shilly, who um, is, um, is a, a young girl when you first meet her and grows into a very, very competent, very smart uh, woman, and you get glimpses of her in her old age as well. So I feel like she's one of the characters that I've known from almost from birth to death, and uh, I feel like I know her very, very well, and I know that she'll always surprise me if I ever get to write uh, anything by her. So she would be my favourite character, I think. I do tend to like my female characters more than my male characters. I certainly like prefer to write female points of view, but um, I'm not entirely sure why that is. <laughs> You know, you get them right. So that's all that really <laughs> I matters. hope so. Oh, I hope so. Um, I, I, a lot of people. I just, I just wanted to thank everybody for sending their messages of uh, encouragement. I've sort of a lot of people say this is really fantastic. They're really enjoying, um, enjoying hearing you speak. And, and Sophie, oh, thank thanks. you very much for her. For the answer it was the answer she was. Oh, good. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> Phew. Um, Oh, how much restraint do I put on? Um, I'll never be a J.R.R. Tolkien who, um, you know, was absolutely rigorous in his linguistic um, 
you know, starting with a language and working up towards names and everything like that. I'll never be like him. But I do try to find names that uh, do several things at once. Um, I like to have names that uh, sound right um, in my head, uh, and hopefully my readers hear them the same way I do, although, of course, you can pronounce my names any way you like, whatever works for you, uh, just as I do with my authors, favourite authors. Uh, I want a word that looks good on the page because names, um, even more so than words, I think, carry with them all sorts of baggage um, that should be evident, as evident as possible in a, a few letters, you know. So one of the things I don't like about sort of 50, 60 science fiction or bad 50, 60 science fiction, uh, in, <laughs> including Doctor Who, I guess as much as I love Doctor Who, is they have these interesting sounding names that when you see them written on the page have the bare minimum of consonants and vowels. There's no, there's no poetry in the spelling. So I'm looking for poetry in the spelling as well. And I'm also looking for deeper meanings too. So uh, most of my names have some kind of symbolic layer uh, that may not be immediately obvious, but sometimes, sometimes are, and sometimes the symbolic meaning is is double layered. So um, I'm struggling to think of one off the top of my head at the moment. But uh, uh, there are names that that people have said, "Oh, this is obviously symbolic, symbolic of such and such," and they've missed the fact that there might be a pun in there as well, or or that there might be an extra layer. But of course, sometimes they're just names of my friends that I like, particularly in Star Wars. I, there's the Star Wars name generator that comes in really, really handy when when you're writing a big epic Star Wars novel like um, Fatal Alliance, which has many, many characters in it. I quickly run out of names, and so I'm always sticking my friends and family members' names into the Star Wars name generator, uh, or mucking around with the speller or spelling of their names to uh, to get new names and to kind of immortalise my friends and also people that I like, like um, Flight of the Concords or the, the Melbourne comedy duo Tripod. They've all appeared in uh, in various Star Wars novels as well. So um, I, I'm I'm not rigorous, uh, but I but I try to have fun and uh, I try to come up with names that I won't get sick of. Seeing things I'll be spending a lot of time with them, um, particularly Star Wars names. Uh, I did have a character who. Uh, in my last Star Wars novel, uh, who's uh, I tried to I was looking at the sort of Star Wars hero names like like Han Solo and Han Solo is a bit of a you know funny old name uh, when a lot of us have grown up with it and we don't even think about it but uh, it's a bit of an odd name so I came up with a character called Jet Nebula and I thought you know that's in the Star Wars spirit and it's a bit of a joke it's not his real name he's flying under a pseudonym and uh, he's picked a silly name. And I thought I'd made it really, really clear in the manuscript that it was a silly name that wasn't supposed to be taken seriously. But uh, uh, when they put the opening chapters up online, the feedback on the opening name was on his name was very, very poor. I think a lot of people hadn't recognised the irony. So we had to make it really, really overt that this was a name that uh, was A, a fake name, and was a fake name that he knew was a silly name. So, uh, so on that level, Jet Nebula is a silly name, but when you tap back to the irony, and I, I, I still quite like it, and hopefully um, others do too. Others have learned to like it, I think. <laughs> uh, what about your, your take on titles? Titles, oh yeah, look. Titles can be really, really hard. Some, some books like, you can see the Changeling and Dust Devils on the screen right now, um, that title's never changed. You can see Trouble Twisters. Uh, the monster went through about nine different titles, and in fact, we'll have different titles in different countries now. The Monster of Portland, um, it'll be in some countries. Trouble Twisters, the magic was originally just Trouble Twisters. Uh, you can see some of the Fixers books there, Planet of the Cyborgs, Invasion of the Freaks, though they, those books had very many titles. Some of my series, um, each book has had five or six or seven different titles. And uh, I don't like to start a book until I know what the title will be, but I'm sanguine and resigned to the fact that sometimes the titles will change because, you know, what I think is a good title isn't always the right title. So um, I had a... That's something that's sort of discussed between you and the editor and the marketing? Yeah. Yep, that's right. Yeah, that's right. We, it's, a, it's a joint conversation. Um, but I had a series called The Orphan Series, and the books ended up being called Echoes of Earth 
Orphans of Earth and Heirs of Earth, and I think they're, they're good titles, but they were nothing like the original titles. And Shane and I really kind of resisted. We had these very arty, farty kind of titles like Crown of Thorns and stuff like that, all very symbolic and dark, but didn't give the impression of a series and, and didn't give an impression of a coherent whole and didn't really sum up what the books are about. So um, we, even though we kind of struggled and grumbled a bit, we went with our editor's suggestions, and, and it was the right thing to do. You know, I think they were the right titles, the, the right titles for the books in the end. Um, so I do give it a lot of thought, and I, I do feel convinced that I've got it right. And we, um, when Twin Maker, the Twin Maker series is, is, is going through this at the moment because uh, I sold the books as Twin Maker. The, the second book is just called Twin Maker, and then the letter Q. And then the third book is just called Twin Maker and then the symbol for infinity, which looks, you know, looks cool. Except how do you search for, if somebody walks, walks into a bookstore and says, I want Twin Maker, the third Twin Maker book. Uh, if somebody remembers it's Twin Maker with the infinity symbol, how are they going to search for it in a database? How are you going to look it up on Amazon.com? So it's a really, really good point. So it's got to change. So I don't know what it'll be. <laughs> Maybe it's a good time to revisit that collaboration. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I, you may notice that oh, I mentioned Shane Dix before, D-I-X. Um, he was my first collaborator. We wrote, oh, I don't know, 12 books together, something like that. Uh, I now write with a fellow called Garth Nix, um, who um, I'm sure you've heard of. Um, I only write with people whose surname end in I-X. Uh, so we've got a wonderful playwright here in South Australia called Pat Ricks. She's next in my sights. Uh, and if Capra, Caprica 6 from Battlestar Galactic was real, I'd be wanting to collaborate with her too, but she, unfortunately she's fictional. Um, I enjoy collaborating because uh, collaborating with the right people forces you to do things differently uh, and to learn new things and results in a book that is like neither a book that neither of you would write. So Trouble Twisters doesn't read like a Sean Williams book and it doesn't read like, read like a Garth Nick's book. It's this weird kind of hybrid of the two of us. And uh, we, by the time we finish working on it, we can't remember who, what, who wrote what sentence. So it really has become in our minds a, a real sort of gestalt kind of effort. Uh, and that's the way it should be, I think. It's not easy getting to that point. Uh, it takes lots of rewrites and lots of discussions and no arguments, luckily. Uh, no, no, we have great fun. We, uh, we, uh, the way we work, way, the way Garth and I work on these books is uh, we um, we spend a lot of time sitting around airports and conventions together, uh, and we often travel to each other's um, towns. He lives in Sydney, so I'm often travelling to Sydney, and he has family here in Adelaide, so he's often travelling to Adelaide. So we get together over a coffee or a pint or lunch or something like that, and discuss um, what the story could be. And uh, um, someone will say, you know, we could we could do this. Jack or Jade could do this, and the other one will say, um, uh, no, no, let's not do that, but let's do this instead. You've given me an idea, let's do this, or yes, we could do that, but why don't we turn up the colour even brighter and, and do this, you know, let's make it even more fantastic. So by bouncing the story backwards and forwards uh, in conversation, we end up with something that's uh, uh, crazier than we would have done on our own and more interesting and more fun. And, uh, it's much better than asking um, readers, like beta readers, about mm. their as well because you're both really invested in the same <laughs> world and so mm. you really yeah. yeah we like similar kind of stories but we're different enough that that, uh, that uh, we usually end up with something much more extreme than we would have come up with on our own and then uh, we will work on a synopsis um, a detailed synopsis and then Garth will write the first chapter to get the ball rolling to kind of set the tone and then uh, because I like writing quickly and I like writing without interruption um, I'll go away and write the rest of the draft and then uh, that draft will then go to Garth and he'll rewrite it and then it'll come back to me and then I will rewrite it and then we'll bounce it backwards and forwards until we're both happy with it. I did mean to ask you, how do you write so much so quickly and not hit you know, a point where you can't really write anymore? Because you seem to have to like Well, there's nothing like... Uh, uh, well, this is all I do. I mean, I've been a, a, a freelance writer doing nothing else for 14 years. And before that... I didn't want to do anything else. I really didn't want to, you know, cut into my writing time at all. So um, I, I'm, I will do anything to make it possible for me to write full time. And that means writing a lot. And uh, and I guess really I learned that I could write every day come hello high water when uh, in the late 90s um, I received a grant from the Australia Council um, to write the books that changed, the Stonemates and the Sea books we saw on the screen earlier. And um, I had 
two and a half years to write these three books. And then Shane and I sold a space opera series, um, the Echoes of Earth books. Uh, and that was um, six books over two and a half years. And, uh, and I was thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I can probably do that. That's a book every six months or whatever. You know, that's not so bad. And I've got Shane to work on three of them, uh, you know, they'll take some of the pressure off. And then I get a phone call from my agent in the States saying, um, I've just sold three Star Wars novels for you and Shane. And I said, um, I've got six books due in the next two and a half years. When are these books due? And he said, oh, in the next two and a half years. And I said, that's nine books, nine books in two and a half years. I don't know that I can do that. And he said, well, do you know that you can't do it? And I said, no. And he said, well, let's just sign the contracts and see what happens. If you fall on a heap, we'll pick up the pieces. So I sat down and uh, I did the math. I, 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 the maths, I, I um, added up the number of words that would be in these books and I divided it by the number of days. And I worked out that it was about 1,500 words a day, uh, every day, uh, with a couple of books off, a couple of weeks off in between books to kind of get my head over it. And I thought, well, I, I can do that. You know, I'm not going to turn down Star Wars and I've already signed these other contracts, so I'll do it. And, uh, and I did do it. And um, 1,500 words isn't a huge amount. Uh, it can be a lot when you're doing other things. You know, if you've got other jobs or you're studying, you know, it can be quite a lot. But this enabled me to write full time, and I thought, well, you know, I should be able to do that in 12 hours a day or whatever. And uh, and I got used to it, addicted to it, some might say. <laughs> that's, a really, that's a really good point in the fact that you know, if if that is your full time, if you're writing nine novels in, in mm. two and a half years, if that's your full time job. That is, and you have, you know, you don't have anything else mm. that. Take your time during the day. Well, yeah, that's right. But there's the rub, you see. So I assumed I'd just be writing new words every day, and I was thinking, 1500 words a day, easy peasy. I'll be lying around my back, drinking mojitos, and you know, on a sunbed. You know, by the third year, it'll be fantastic. But what I forgot was that there are several different stages to writing a book, and there's only and writing the book is only one of them. Then you've got to rewrite it. There's editing. There's um, publicity. Um, there's reading page proofs, there's all this kind of stuff. And uh, what I forgot, but I, what I learned in the last year was that uh, in the morning I'd be writing my 1,500 words, in the afternoon I'd be doing copy edits or rewriting, uh, and in the evening I'd be doing publicity, uh, or I'd be travelling. So in that one year I did every single literary festival in Australia uh, and one overseas. Um, uh, four of my books came out the same month. Uh, but I and I thought that's cool. I think of the publicity that will cause. What I didn't think of was that meant that I had four page proofs arrive arrive on the same month. That all had to be back on the same day. So on top of writing 1,500 words a day, I was proofing four different books. So it really did my head in that last year. And as as my I certainly wasn't poor. God, I was I was completely fried. It was a it was an amazing experience because it proved to me that I could do it if I had to. It also proved to me that I don't ever want to do it again. But there there have been periods. Uh, and as, as my career, as I become more successful, um, I learned that less and less of what I do is actually about the writing. There's, there's so much other stuff to do. You know, there's, there's going to con conventions, there's meeting editors, there's um, writing copy for your covers, there's um, doing, doing social media, there's, um, there's giving back to the community, so being on committee, committees and writing um, um, you know, letters to support new writers or writing manuscript reports or... Ah uh, no, but it's really important because people helped me out when I started out too, and and really this is my job. You know, all I have to do is write books and and be engaged with the community. And uh, if I drop being engaged with the community, then I don't know. I don't want to be that kind of writer. I don't want to be a challenger, hold up somewhere, going slightly mad. I think it's good to meet young people like yourself, Emily, and uh, who you learn from and uh, um, uh, and do new things. With like this. <laughs> I, can, I can help with the technology aspect. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Excellent. That's right. Hurrah. <laughs> there was a question from, um, from, from Marine, and, and she actually did want to know um, what is the best way to reach an audience with new media? What have you found? Mm. What's for you? I know you're on Twitter a lot. I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I'm on Twitter or Facebook enough, uh, and this is something that I'm still learning. I think the best way to reach your audience is to write the best book possible. And uh, if social media uh, is getting in the way of you doing that, then I think social media loses, <laughs> if that makes sense. I think the, the story should always come first. Um, but I think the most important thing about engaging with new media is to not to do something you don't want to do. If you don't enjoy Twittering, tweeting, or you don't enjoy being on Facebook, don't do it because people can tell. And certainly don't get on there and just do publicity stuff. Don't just 
hammer your work down somebody's throat because people can tell and people run a mile from that kind of stuff. Uh, I tend to only tweet or Facebook when, well, I do do some of the publicity stuff because I feel that I have to. I feel like my publishers will get grouchy if I don't. But I, if, if I see something during my morning reading on Boing Boing or io9 uh, that, that, that I feel passionate about, whether it makes me laugh or whether it makes me angry or whether it makes me really interested, that's when I, that's when I reach for the social media. That's when I, uh, you know, go to Pinterest or, or Facebook or whatever. Uh, because I figure that if I'm interested in it, somebody else will be, and uh, it might be nice to have a conversation about it. Or, or people might go, "What the hell is Williams on about? You know, what's he on? God, you know." Because I was, uh, you know, I worry sometimes that I'll say something really, really stupid. But you know, I figure that of the fifteen hundred people, seventeen hundred people I've, I've connected to on Facebook, you know, a couple of hundred are probably my friends and will be forgiving of anything stupid I say, and everybody else is probably ignoring me anyway. So. <laughs> So I figure I just try to be honest to myself and, and just try to keep talking about stuff that I like and responding to what other people say. It's keeping up with what other people have to say that I find really hard. I feel like uh, there's so much interesting stuff happening out there and if I stop to engage with it, then I don't do my work. Um, so that's the tricky part. It's a balance. It's a balance, yeah. Mm. Um, I, I did have a, a question here that I, I, I didn't quite understand it when I first got it, but I think that I do now. Um, Someone was asking, um, would you do your, and I think this is to do with themes, like putting themes in your books. Mm. So, so would you do like writing that's like part fiction, part practical need? So for example, for a theme like say humanity becoming greener, for example, mm. do you think about those sorts of things when you write your books? And if not, is that something that you would think about doing? I do. Yeah, I do. I sometimes I don't know what I'm I'm talking about when I start writing a book. It's not until uh, I finish the book that I know that ah, this is a book about father son relationships or whatever. Uh, or this book, uh, this is a book about friendship and communication and whatever. But sometimes I go into books uh, with an interesting thing I want to explore. Like my Geodesica series uh, has a culture in it in which privacy, as we understand it, is illegal. Uh, it's not that it's a totalitarian state, but that the culture doesn't allow or doesn't want to foster secrecy um, because when you keep things behind closed door, doors, they would say, um, bad things can happen, you know, um, not necessarily child abuse or whatever, but, you know, if, if everything is exposed or political corruption, you know, if you can look into Obama's uh, office at any time and see what he's talking about or listen, read every single email um, to do with petrochemical mining in the Arctic, you know, people will be less inclined, you know, in theory, to lie or steal. So I wrote this book wanting to explore this particular idea and perhaps challenge the, the idea that privacy is something that's sacred and shall not ever be violated, which is, you know, an ongoing discussion in the internet age. Um, so there's that. And in my Astropolis series, I, I really wanted to explore notions of gender and sexuality and um, how that might be kind of slippery in the very, very distant future where um, gender is, is, is something you choose as well as something you're born with and how um, various changes to your idea of self might change the way you express yourself in a gendered kind of way. So I do go into books trying to explore these kind of things, but I but it's not, it's part of the book, it's not where I start with the books. So you, so. Don't, so you don't like set out to write a novel to, to try and make people be more Kind of environment or... No, I think uh, I, I, the stories start with characters and setting, uh, and everything else kind of evolves out of that um, plot and theme and style. Um, Astropolis was one of those crazy series where it had uh, lots of everything in it. Um, I had lots of interesting science fiction ideas I wanted to explore. I had a character who only spoke in the lyrics of Gary Newman, a musician, so I wanted to do that to explore how that would change my voice when it came to writing for that character. Um, it also explored the Gothic, so each each book had lots of references to um, um, writers like uh, Maturin and um, um, Poe, uh, etc. So this book was full of stuff that I was interested in, um, but it didn't start with any of them, really. It actually started with a restaurant. Um, I was having dinner with Garth Nix and some editors, editor friends in a restaurant called the, the Flower Drum in Melbourne, and I thought, the name The Flower Drum was so evocative that it, it uh, prompted an image which uh, then led to this whole series of books. I'm just going to quickly uh, ask for, for people's feedback here. 
Um, I just had a couple of people say that the sound is breaking up. How ah. about now? Okay. Are you, can you hear us now? Can you hear us now? Just uh, a little bit of a yes or a no. Yes, okay. Yes, good. Ah, good. It's Phew. Gone, it's gone good. <laughs> It may have been our internet connection, it may have been your internet connection. <laughs> uh, these sorts of things unfortunately happen with webinars, but uh, fingers crossed our recording will sound good so that even if you miss some of it, uh, it'll be recorded and it'll be up on the blog so that people can revisit it. Cool. Um, I did have a question here on ebook. Sure. <laughs> uh, what are your takes on uh, ebook uh, in regards to, you know, intellectual property and fair payment of Ah, uh, yeah, look, that's, I've been waiting for ebooks for years and years and years and years and I'm so excited that they're finally here. As a reader, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, I love it. I, I, I don't want anything to stop it or make it getting, get in the way of it. But it is kind of tricky. Um, I'm a little less worried than I probably should be. I've been wanting to give my books away on the internet uh, ever since I got onto the internet back in the mid-90s. Uh, and I haven't been allowed to, so I still have this instinct to just give it away. But of course you can't do that now because a very large percentage of income comes from the internet. Uh, I'm troubled by the sort of balkanization of the global market. Um, I wish there would just be one format, uh, one place you could buy it and, uh, and it would work on all e-readers. We seem to be a very, very long way from that. I'm constantly frustrated by reading a review of a book um, or hearing about a book written by a friend of mine, going to buy it and not being able to buy it because we don't have an Amazon in Australia or I don't have a Kindle um, or uh, it's, you know, it's just not available, flat out available in Australia because the rights haven't been sold here. It, I find it eternally frustrating and annoying um, and has led me to pirate books. I mean, I'll buy the paper book, um, but I will pirate a copy of it because I, I don't want to read a paper book. I've, I suffer from RSI, my hand hurts when I hold big books. Um, I want to read it electronically and I feel very grouchy and annoyed when I, as a consumer, when I can't uh, get access to any media. I mean, this isn't just books, it's also television and films. Um, I kind of want it now and I'm willing to pay a lot for it, but if well, I'm not able to, it makes me very cranky, but I'm not sure there's an easy way to get to that world. Um, I, had, I, had always, I had a thought that I was wondering whether, you know, the first publisher that you go to, whether they're just the ones who get the worldwide Maybe, maybe I don't know. But what happens? Yeah, the, 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 it's such a grey area. That I could think of five different scenarios probably where that wouldn't work. Or uh, yeah, you know, what if you, the first publisher you went to, you sold it to them for five thousand dollars, you sold the Australian publishing rights and the world ebook rights, but then the American publishers offered. $100,000 but one of the ebook rights but the Australian publishers had it so then they bought the ebook rights from the Australian publishers for $20,000 and you didn't get a cent or or the sale didn't go through because you couldn't give them world ebook rights you know it's yeah you don't want anything to get in the in the way of the author making the, the living they deserve um, or the readers getting access to the books in a way that they deserve so I don't, I don't have any answers but I but I am concerned I know that we're not there yet it's early days yet I think we haven't got the model yet but I think there'll be a lot of pain and suffering in the book industry until we get to the model. I think there's still upheaval to come. Going to the World Fantasy Convention, I, I'm going to be meeting a couple of authors there, and so I decided that I had to read at least one book for every author that I was mm. going to meet. But there were a couple of them that in the end I just didn't get the for because of that. Process. Yeah, that's right. And even I, I mean, I know a lot of writers, and I feel really embarrassed saying, Actually, I'm a big fan of Madeline Robbins. She writes, writes a wonderful series of books called the Zero Tolerance books. You just can't get them electronically in Australia and I've had to buy books and read them. I could have emailed her, but I know Mad. I could have emailed her and said, can you give me a file? Here's the receipt, you know. But I feel, I don't feel that's quite appropriate either. I mean, I have done it a couple of times and I've absolutely had to, but, uh, but uh, uh, not, yeah, mm, it's tricky. It's tricky. <laughs> I'm going to have to, we're, we're sort of coming up to the hour mark now, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the last two questions and then, um, and then I'll get Sean to read a little something, something for you. Um, so uh, I did have one question, uh, and we may not spend too long on this, but I just want to know, based on your previous study of economics, <laughs> how do you feel about the current world I think the economic situation at the moment is uh, very dire. I think uh, uh, it's a little bit like the ebook situation. I think the model we're running, the models we're running on now, aren't the right models. And I think we're 
coming close to a crisis that will force us to realise it, uh, but we don't quite know what the model that will replace them is yet. It's neither communism nor capitalism. There's some other model, some geniuses out there uh, waiting to come up with it. I don't know what it'll be, uh, but I'm hoping that the transition won't be too awful, won't be too painful and won't be too horrible. I've, I did study economics for a couple of years before I dropped out to become a writer, and I've only ever used my economics training once in a story. Uh, I used the, the, the idea of the velocity of money in a story called The End of the World Begins at Home, and I was very proud that my economics training had come useful, if only for one story. Didn't win any awards, wasn't anybody's favourite, <laughs> but uh, but I, I quite like it. I, think, um, I just want to say, I think that was Scott's question. I, I had a... I had a I had a comment here, good question, uh, and I think it was your Scott, so yes, thank you very much for <laughs> asking that question. <laughs> um, Scott, is, um, Scott is someone that I talk to on, on Facebook, and he's got a uh, wonderful consortium of people who sort of, you know, look to, to try and save the world, and mm. make it a greener place one mm. step at a time. I like Kim Stanley Robinson's idea. Kim Stanley Robinson, you know, a hugely successful, multi-award winning science fiction writer, uh, has has really investigated this area in ways that I'm not qualified to. He has all interesting post-capitalist, pseudo-capitalist kind of models and uh, he's fascinating to read. Uh, his ideas are fascinating to read and I highly recommend you search out his ideas online because they're, they're very lucid and, uh, God, I hope one of them works because uh, we need we need something like that. It's a real mess at the moment. Thanks, Scott. Good question. Um, in, in contact with um, and now the final question that I did have, and this one is from Sheila, is that do you still get rejection? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, rejections are just one of those things that you have to expect and and learn to just not live with, but just uh, not even get fussed by. Uh, I used to think that once I'd um, had my first novel published and won my first awards or won, become a New York Times bestseller or whatever, that it would be easy streets from then on. Uh, but it's not. I get rejected um, just as often as I used to, possibly more so, um, possibly because I'm sending my novels out to more markets or to places like Hollywood Studios or you know, they're getting more reviews and, and therefore there are numerically more bad reviews. Uh, but I think you you can't you can't you can't let it get in the way. It can bother you and you, it can make you want to rage and scream and uh, you know, tear things up and stamp your feet. Uh, but you I have needed I have learned not to let that feeling stick around for long and I can't let it get in the way of my writing because I have to keep writing, otherwise I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, Ursula Le Guin was once asked, once asked, you know, if you weren't a writer, what would you be? And she said, dead. And that's kind of how I feel. I'm not qualified to do anything else. <laughs> if, I, if I'm going to let rejections worry me, then um, I might as well give up now. And I think Neil Gaiman put it very well. Someone, he once said that, you know, I, I can't remember his exact wording, but uh, whenever somebody writes a bad review or rejects you, that should just fuel you on, fuel your rage and uh, make you write something even better that nobody else could possibly ever reject. And every writer in the world will stop writing because, you know, the perfect thing ever has been written. <laughs> and there's no point writing anymore. So uh, take it as a challenge. Awesome. <laughs> that's, that's a great view of, of, of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are so many things that will knock you down in writing. If you, if, if you want to be put off writing, um, you don't have to look very far. You know, the, the pay is terrible on the whole, the hours are long, uh, there are, you know, there's rejections, there's, uh, yeah, you need to concentrate on the positive, which sounds very sort of new agey and wishy-washy, but it's true. <laughs> it's hard some days, I tell you, it's not always easy. <laughs> Yes, sure. Well, I've got. I pulled out a little short story here. This is the last short story I had published. It'll go for about fifteen minutes. Is that does that sound about right? That's okay. It's uh, it's set in that fantasy world that I was talking about before, and uh, the main character is a young boy called Roz. He's about thirteen or fourteen at this stage, and uh, uh, perhaps I shouldn't explain too much. Perhaps I should just uh, just read it. Okay. Um, I'll shut up and read. I'll take my glasses off and come in close so I can read it. Uh, I've never read this aloud before, so um, excuse me if I fumble. Um, it's called 
the mirror in the middle of the maze. <clears throat> Excuse me. The walls of the maze were made of rough-hewn yellow stone, the walls and ceilings too. Occasional gleams of quartz threw Roz's clear yellow light back at him like the eyes of spiders at night. Roz played with the scant wisps of hair and it with the scant wisps of hair on his chin and thought hard. The tunnel he had been following terminated at a crossroads. Over the years, he had escaped from several mazes set by his teacher, Master Pukye. This one contained no swirling, tantalising lights to distract him, no puzzles to solve, apart from the maze itself, and no sharp-toothed creatures snapping at his backside to make him hurry. But this maze was potentially the most dangerous of all, and he had to consider his options carefully. The air from each of the tunnels ahead of him smelt and felt the same. Each path seemed equally curved as far as his eye could see. None of them gave any sign that it would lead to the centre of the maze. Giving up on reason, Roz tried chance instead. He gritted his teeth, gripped his chin hairs tightly and pulled. Two came loose. By a code he had determined earlier, that meant he should take the second entrance on his left. Straight ahead, in other words. It had better be the right one, he told himself, or he would soon run out of bum fluff. That was the least of his worries. He scored a notch in the yellow wall and set off down the new tunnel. It wound left, then right, then left again. No junctions, no tempting passageways to either side. Was he imagining it, or did the air smell fresher? He put on speed, beginning to hope that this time he had found the one, that he was at last about to reach the centre. Roz ran around the third bend and skidded to a halt. Ahead of him was a wall of yellow stone and gleaming quartz, another dead end. He took a deep breath, telling himself that he wasn't scared, not of a maze, no matter how strange it might seem, no matter how deadly. The floor vibrated underfoot. Dust rained from the ceiling above. The candle flame burning in his palm began to dance as though in a fitful breeze. Instinctively, Roz crouched down as the maze contracted around him, growing fractionally smaller in less time than it took to turn around in a circle twice. When he stood up again, the tips of his dusty hair brushed the ceiling of the maze, where before they had felt nothing. He dusted himself down and turned back the way he had come, resolved not to think of how many more dead ends he could afford, how much smaller the maze could get each time. It had started innocently enough with quite understandable curiosity. What happened to your last apprentice, Master Pukier? You don't need to know. He had been twelve years old the first time he had asked that question, and unsatisfied with his teacher's dismissive answer, he had repeated the question at every opportunity. Now he was fourteen, and in all the time between, Master Pouquier had never once mentioned, revealed anything about his other students. Roz knew he wasn't the first. It was only natural that he wanted to know more about the ones who had come before him. I don't understand why you won't tell me about them. Did they grow up to be famous change workers, or did something horrible happen to them? I told you, you don't need to know. Something horrible will happen to you if you keep asking. If he asked once, he asked a thousand times to no avail, until just a week ago, while setting camp in the hollow of a stony outcrop, his back carefully turned while his teacher changed from dragon to imp form. He said, Please, Master Pouquet, won't you tell me what happened to your last apprentice? You don't want to know. This slight difference in wording caught Roz's ear immediately. I do want to know, Master Pouquet. Why would I ask you so often if I didn't? His teacher came round to face him. There was no mistaking the mischievousness in his tilted, glittering eyes. You only think you want to know, he said, because you don't know anything, really. That's true, Master Pouquier, said Roz, in his most humble voice, but if you won't tell me, how will I ever learn? The imp barked a laugh. All right, but I need you to fetch some things first, particular plants that grow in the shadows round here, deep in the cracks where the sun never shines. We want water too, and a fire. Roz wondered why all this was necessary just to learn a little history, but he did as he was told, and come nightfall, as the fat moon rose up in a bright starry sky, he got his answer. You want to know what happened to my last apprentice? Master Pouquet held out a stone beaker containing the potion he had made. Drink this. Roz took the beaker and studied its contents. The potion was thick and greenish, with numerous black dots floating on its surface like pimples. As he stared, one of the dots popped, emitting a puff of mist that stank of ancient swamps and underpants. What is it? You see what it is. I mean, what does it do? It does what it does. Roz rolled his eyes. Sometimes having a conversation with his teacher was like being tied up in knots. I mean, what does this have to do with your last apprentice? Drink it and find out. It smells like poison. Master Pouquier squatted in front of Roz so the fire was at his back. A falling log sent out a spray of golden sparks that rose up above his head like a halo. He folded his hands and settled down, watching Roz's internal struggle play out. 
Don't you trust me, Roz? Roz didn't know how to answer that question. Sometimes he felt as though he were learning matters of great profundity from the creature he was apprenticed to, but other times he felt that Master Pukia was toying with him, keeping him busy so he wouldn't learn anything important on his own. Should I trust, her, trust you, Master Pukia? I don't know. Can you? Roz agonised for a dozen breaths. If he didn't drink the potion, he would always wonder. Raising the beaker, he knocked back its contents in three gulps, willing himself not to taste the potion as it slid down his throat. There, he gagged, handing his teacher the empty beaker. So what's the big secret? Wait and see. Master Pouquet leaned close to catch him as the fire went out and the world fled. When Roz woke, he was in darkness, lying limp on his side with his mouth full of dust. It took four attempts to get to his feet and two to conjure a small amount of light. Only then did he learn that he was in a vaulted hall, the ceiling of which hung far above his head, just out of reach of his tiny flame. He didn't know about the maze until he followed the hall to the first intersection and learned that it was just one of many such halls, wending and winding through unknown depths of the earth. He knew all about mazes, specifically that they had centres. Hard experience had taught him that if he could find the centre of this one, Master Pukier would let him out. He had no reason to believe that this maze was different to any other. Then he took a wrong turn and met his first dead end. With a shudder, like one of his teacher's dragonish late-night shivers, the maze shrunk around him and suddenly, where before had been only shadow, he could see the yellow ceiling. And that was weird. Two more dead ends and the ceiling came within reach of his questing fingers. That was worrying and weird, given he still had no gut feeling on how to navigate the maze. The magical skills Master Pukia had taught him were no use to him in here. He didn't let that deter him. If anything, Roz's determination grew stronger. He would find the centre somehow and make the maze his own and show Master Pukier that he wasn't so easily cowed. Two more dead ends, two more grinding, unstoppable contractions crushed his certainty somewhat. Using his bare hands, he tried digging his way out to the ceiling and nearly brought a landslide down upon him. Was this what happened to your last apprentice? He shouted at the yellow halls. Did you put him in here too? There was no answer but a distant rumbling as of mocking laughter. If talking to Master Puke was like being tied up in knots, his silences were like being tied up and rolled off a cliff. Roz walked carefully back to the crossroads and took the left path, ducking his head to avoid banging in on rocky outcrops. The risk of taking a wrong turn was undiminished, but he would rather fail by trying than by sitting in the dark alone. Inaction was for the wise, his teacher sometimes said, and for the old, Roz always replied. At the next dead end, he was forced back the way he had come, in a painful crouch. This time he went straight across the intersection to the one tunnel he hadn't followed, another curving, sweeping route that led to a T-junction. He went right, feeling the awkwardness of his hunched posture in the muscles of his back and thighs. The dead end he found there reduced him to a crawl, and crawling meant no light because his hands were busy. But he didn't complain, he said nothing at all. The only thing he could do was retreat and press on, feeling for the notches he had left and hoping the maze would make sense sooner rather than later, because at this rate there might, might not be a later much longer. Another intersection and then another, his knees were bruised and raw by the time he found himself by the time he found himself nose to stone at another dead end. He wrapped his arms around his head as the tunnel shook and shrank. He hacked and coughed in the rising dust. Afterwards there was barely sufficient light to turn around, sufficient space to turn around. Roz fought a rising panic. He wasn't ordinarily afraid of small spaces, but this was different. This was a nightmare. Who knew how much further he had to go before reaching the centre of the maze, crawling on hands and knees until they were bloody to the bone. He didn't dare imagine what it would be like to be trapped down here forever, lost like a rat in a snake warren with no inn. He kept fear at bay, barely, by telling himself that Master Pukier never did anything without a purpose, even if it was at first inscrutable. He wouldn't throw away the life of his apprentice on a whim, even if Roz was just the latest of many. But what about a failed apprentice? Shut up, he told that treacherous part of his brain. I've beaten everything else he's thrown at me, and I'll beat this too. After the next dead end, he couldn't turn. He had to back up awkwardly to the last intersection and twist until his spine almost snapped to fit into the next tunnel. And then, when that tunnel also turned into a dead end, he found that he could no longer crawl at all. He could only creep along by flexing his toes and his fingers like some ungainly human earthworm, unable to see anything, unable to hear anything but the desperate rasping of his breath. Please, it sounded like, please. And the rhythm of his flexing limbs went, what happened? What happened? They couldn't all be dead ends, could they? He almost wept when the tunnel he had been painfully inching along concluded in, not the centre of the maze, but one more blank yellow wall. 
The maze squeezed in around him, gripping him as tightly as a stone coffin, and so it might as well have been. Master, why? he asked, unable to move even a fingertip. What did I do wrong? How did I fail you? His voice sounded very loud to his dust-plugged ears, but no one answered. There was nowhere else to go. He was trapped. The air was already growing stale. He sagged into feet, wishing he had never wondered about the apprentices that had come before him, boys he had never known and should have cared less than nothing about. Maybe their skeletons littered corners of the maze he hadn't reached yet, and now his would join them. He could go no further, no matter how much he might want to. His journey was over. He would die ignorant, die denied the future he had dreamed of. I'm sorry, he whispered to Addie, the girl he had promised himself to long ago, even though there was no possible way she could hear him now. He had reached the end. In the lightless coffin, Roz's eyes suddenly shot open. The darkness looked the same, but everything was suddenly different. He had reached the end. Could it be so simple? He didn't dare hope, but hope blazed in him anyway. There was nowhere left for him to go, so couldn't it be said that he had, in a weird way, reached the centre of the maze? This was exactly the kind of riddle his teacher might call education. Master Pukier, I get it, he croaked. I am the centre. Now let me out of here before I choke. Through layers of stone, like a distant earthquake, came the same mocking chuckle as before, and for a terrible moment Rods feared that he was wrong, that the end of his subterranean struggles really did mean the end for him too. But then the stone flexed around him, bucking and buckling his body into a series of unnatural shapes. His skull was squeezed so tightly he saw tiny lights in his eyes. Then all the lights coalesced into one, growing brighter and brighter, and he was moving, surging forward as though on the back of an avalanche, tumbling, turning and falling heavily to the ground at the feet of an open-mouthed dragon a dragon who had coughed him up like a furball from depths he couldn't fathom. Welcome back, said Master Pouquier. Have a nice trip. Roz laughed, coughed, then laughed some more. The stars were impossibly clear and the air smelled sweeter than he had ever known it to before. He was alive. Did I imagine it, he managed to say. I can't really have been inside you, can I? What difference does it make? The important thing is that you learned your lesson. Tell me what that was. I am the centre of the maze, Roz repeated. I think he can do better than that. Roz composed himself, forcing his aching limbs into a sitting position and raising a small cloud of yellow dust as he did so. I am the architect of my own confusion? Could be. Being with you is making me more lost than ever? Now you're trying too hard, Master Pouquier grinned. Maybe I just want you to think twice before accepting a potion from someone, no matter how trustworthy they might seem. So I shouldn't trust you. I don't care if you do or do not, Roz. Just trust yourself more. Roz thought all this through, wondering if he was dreaming this conversation too. The scabs and scrapes seemed real. He was thirsty and tired, and, judging by the stars, some hours had passed. The experience was real enough. The lesson too, whatever that was supposed to be. He felt a rising dizziness, the after-effects of the potion, he assumed. You said I'd find out what happened to your last apprentice. And you did, Roz. She went into the maze, just like you. But did she pass the test? No, I ate her. I don't believe you, Roz said. All right, then. She was smarter than you and got out within half an hour. Does that make you feel any better? Roz lay back down and closed his eyes, which did nothing at all to quell his vertigo. Real or hallucinatory, the world was fading again. I don't think either of those stories are true, Master Pouquier. I don't think that really matters. Roz's teacher curled around him in dragon form like a giant leathery jog and gently covered him with one warm, expansive wing. You're here. Let that be enough for now. the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean. I have, um, I have Norda, uh, she just wanted to say how much she really loves your stuff. And, um, and thank you. Thank you so much. She's a big fan. Oh, thank you. Um, My pleasure. Green very much liked the smells like ancient swamps and underpants. <laughs> <laughs> I like that line too. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> Scott said thank you so much. He loves listening to you um, to speak it. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Sophie wanted to thank you as well. Thanks, and, Sophie. Uh, Deb, Deb said that she actually she loved listening to you read it because it was much better than her reading it. <laughs> thank you. So, um, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Maureen and Sheila. Thanks for your and questions applause. and thanks for listening. Applause <laughs> <laughs> from Scott. But, um, <laughs> Cheers. As you can see, guys, on the screen, if you want to contact Sean, this is yeah. you can contact him. Um, I am planning to hold some more Meet the Author webinars when Sean, you know, officially announces Twin Maker. Maybe <laughs> I can convince him to come on again. Anytime, Emily, anytime. And, Thanks for having um, me. And so if you, if you wanted to, I suppose, 
we won't I won't be doing any more this year. I've got a busy <laughs> end of year. You have got a busy next year. Um, if you go to tiny.cc slash forward slash meet the author, um, you just stick in your email and we'll send you updates whenever we have some new uh, author webinars. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Emily. No problem. Thanks, Sean. Bye. Bye.